It is just after midnight on August 17th, 2009, just off the west coast of Florida. A beautiful EC-145 medical helicopter is about to pick up a patient on a nearby island when the helicopter softly and gently flies right into the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. This is an amazing story with lots of lessons to be learned. Many mistakes were made and there's all kinds of curveballs in this story. Coming up on this episode of The Dr. Medic. All right, welcome back to The Dr. Medic, everybody. In this episode, I'm telling you right now, this story is going to take some crazy twists and turns. Some of it will be interesting, some of it may seem childish, and some of it will probably resonate with anyone who has ever worked in a toxic work environment. There are a million rabbit holes that this story could go down, and the only one I'm going to go down is the one that deals with the data and the evidence. There's many sides to some of the pieces of this story, and I'm just going to have to leave those parts to those who were there to live through it. For now, we've got a lot to cover with this one, so let's get started. This story takes place off the coast of southwest Florida near Fort Myers. In Florida, many of the best EMS agencies are actually third-service, government-run county EMS services. In this case, we're talking about Lee County EMS. Not only does Lee County EMS cover over a thousand square miles and run over 80,000 calls a year between their 36 dedicated EMS stations, at the time, they also had their very own medical helicopter called MedStar. This was a very small flight service that was not your typical medical helicopter you'd normally find in the United States. They did not focus heavily on inter-facility transports and instead, focused mainly on trauma and rescue calls. They flew big, beautiful helicopters such as the B0105 and the Bell 430. Remember Airwolf? Well, 430 is basically an updated, more powerful and stretched version of that helicopter, but with four blades instead of two. And of course, they also flew this beautiful EC-145. And it's this 145 that's going to be the topic of this story. Most of the EMS helicopters in the States are staffed with a single pilot, a flight paramedic, and a flight nurse. Being that MedStar didn't really focus on inter-facility transfers, they did not utilize a flight nurse and instead had two critical care flight paramedics and a single pilot. But at MedStar, the pilot was usually also an EMT, which is super cool. Like I said, the aircraft for this flight was a Eurocopter EC-145, and personally, I think this is one of the coolest and most well-equipped helicopters in the entire world for medevac operations. It has two Turbo Mecha Aerial 1E2 turboshaft engines, each putting out about a 750 horsepower. It can operate as dual pilot, even with the stretcher system installed. It has autopilot, can fly IFR, and can load patients from the rear via a regular ambulance stretcher. This particular aircraft was built in 2003 and had a total of just 2,979 total flight hours and was owned and operated by Lee County. Its last inspection was just three days before the accident. The pilot was a 48-year-old female who held an airline transport certificate with a rotorcraft rating as well as a commercial pilot certificate for single-engine airplanes. She was issued a cleared medical certificate from the FAA on February 24, 2009 and had a total of 21 years experience flying EMS helicopters. She had a total of 6,061 hours of total flight time and 4,810 of them were in helicopters with 621 of them on this type of aircraft. She first learned to fly with the United States Army in 1982 and then flew helicopters for the National Guard in 1988. She was hired with Lee County EMS in 1998 and flew the beautiful B0105 up until they purchased this EC-145 as a second helicopter. In the back of the aircraft were two very experienced critical care flight paramedics. The accident flight originated on the mainland at Page Field Airport. The crew were dispatched at four minutes past midnight for a 63-year-old male patient who had fallen 
and struck his head on a beam of a dock, causing a severe head injury. The patient was located on North Captiva Island, which is one of several large barrier islands off the west coast of Florida. While there are many homes and some businesses on these islands, there are no roads that lead to them and they are only accessible by boat or air. This particular island did have a volunteer fire department, in this case the Upper Captiva Fire and Rescue District, who responded to this patient first and then subsequently called for air transport by MedStar. The flight crew launched without incident and flew under a Part 91 certificate on the way to the emergency. Part 91 is a certificate that an air operator and the pilot must possess and typically governs the general operating flight rules for civil, non-commercial aircraft. This certificate requirement may change once the helicopter picks up a patient though. The operator has two choices at that point. One, they can continue to operate under Part 91 as part of like a public service where they are doing transports and rescues at no cost to those persons whom they transport or rescue. Or two, if they choose to collect money for their services, the operator and the pilot would need to operate under a Part 135 certificate as you are now operating as more of an air taxi with paying customers and you are now considered more of a commercial aircraft. This is exactly the same type of certificate that all of the major airlines would operate under. And under Part 135, all operators are held to a higher standard for many flight rules due to the fact that there are paying customers on board. This discussion will play a major role later on in this story. So like I said, they originally flew and departed Page Field under a Part 91 certificate and headed almost due west to North Captiva Island. The pilot had the autopilot engaged and set to hold an altitude of 1,000 feet. Once they passed some towers that were located on an island between the mainland and Captiva Island called Pine Island, the altitude was then lowered to 800 feet. The pilot now has the landing zone in her sights, which is a grass airfield that's oddly enough called the Salty Approach. The pilot could see the fire truck setting up the landing zone and was trying to contact them on the radio and did not receive a response after four or five attempts. With a volunteer fire department on a secluded island with good weather and an improved landing zone, not being able to contact a ground crew would normally not be much of an issue and is actually more common than one might think. This pilot had been to this airfield several times before and would not have had any issues landing the aircraft safely on her own. The pilot then states over her comms that they are about three minutes out. She then selected 500 feet altitude hold on her autopilot with about 80 knots of forward speed. The helicopter then starts to slowly descend from 800 feet as she then states on her comms, we are one minute out. As they are descending, one of the paramedics states that he cannot see anything out of his window. The pilot replies, well this is normal since we're so far out over the water there is not anything to see. The other paramedic noted at this point that he noticed what appeared to be rain and water on the windows, and since he knew it was a clear night out, that it was not raining and that this must be rotor wash from the blades. Just a moment later, the pilot turns on her searchlight and notices that the water is right below her. Before she can call out any emergency, the helicopter impacts the water. The helicopter immediately flips over and sinks in seconds. The fire department, who is still waiting back at the airfield, does not know that the helicopter has crashed. They attempted to reach the aircraft on both their VHF and 800 MHz channels, but could not do so. Back in the dispatch center, the dispatcher noted that the aircraft appeared to stop moving on her GPS tracker. But instead of initiating a search and rescue plan of some sort, she instead rebooted her computer because she thought that her computer must have froze. During this time, each of the crew were able to escape the sinking helicopter and then climb on top of the helicopter's belly as the aircraft had come to rest in about 8 foot of water. They began using their emergency whistles and flashlights to call for help almost 200 yards offshore from Captiva Island. 
After about 10 minutes, the fire department ends up calling the dispatch center and asking where the aircraft is. It was only at this time that the dispatcher realized that MedStar never made it to their landing zone. At about the same time, a random witness on the island ran over to the firefighters and told them that they believed that they just saw an aircraft crash into the water. The fire department immediately sent out their rescue boat and all three crew members were rescued and escaped with only mild injuries. Both the crew and the original patient were transported back to the mainland on other helicopters. The original patient? Well, he escaped major injuries from his fall, but he did receive 13 stitches in his head. So how could this super high-tech helicopter with only a few thousand hours on it crash unexpectedly like this? Well, the helicopter impacted the water in the intercoastal waterways about 600 feet off the northeast side of the island in about 6 to 8 feet of water. A quick FAA inspection revealed that all of the flight controls had normal continuity and that there were no anomalies noted with the helicopter's engines. The tail boom became separated during the crash and there was substantial damage to the fuselage and the main rotor blades. In short, there was nothing obviously wrong with this aircraft before it crashed. It is absolutely amazing that these three crew members escaped with only minor injuries. All three were wearing their seatbelts and all three had their helmets on. Had even one of them taken off their helmet before they crashed, they could have easily bumped their head on impact, which would have been enough for them to momentarily lose consciousness, which then would cause them to drown because the aircraft immediately filled up with water and sank. Also, each of them had just completed water egress training just three months prior to this crash. Helicopters are absolutely notorious for flipping over in the water. All of their primary flight controls, engines, and the transmission, they're all located above the crew and patient compartments, causing the aircraft to be extremely top-heavy. But this means that when they hit the water, they are going to flip over very quickly since their center of gravity is so high up on the frame. However, none of the crew were wearing life vests, but they were carried on the helicopter. After the impact and the crash, the crew members discussed going back into the helicopter to retrieve their life preservers, but they agreed that the helicopter was relatively stable enough and decided against going back inside the aircraft and stayed on top of the belly. As a result of this accident, the company then required pilots and flight paramedics to wear their life preserver from takeoff to landing on every single flight. This helicopter had all kinds of amazing recording equipment and technology on the aircraft, which included an L3 Targa flight data recorder, a Garmin GPS navigation comm equipment, Technosonic comm unit, and an ECT helicopter monitoring unit as well. But all of these were destroyed by the salt water corroding the electrical contacts and the batteries, with the exception of that L3 flight data recorder. The data recorder records all kinds of data inputs, including headings and measurements, as well as all of the flight inputs and flight controls. This is essentially the black box for this aircraft. You know how your devices might use an SD card for storage? Well, this L3 box uses what's called a PCM CIA card, which is essentially a bigger form of an SD card. When they accessed the data, the investigators found that the data was from the original flight from the Eurocopter factory back when the aircraft was originally delivered to MedStar. Lee County stated that they did not have a process for deleting old data from these cards. And this means that while this data recorder was perfectly functional and intact, it didn't record anything because the card was full. This helicopter was also equipped with a Terrain Awareness Warning System, or TAWS, which alerts the pilot to any terrain that is in the direct pathway of the helicopter's trajectory. It alerts the pilot by emitting a distinctive warning and telling the pilot to pull up or terrain ahead or something like that. The TAWS bases its readings off of the radar altimeter in the aircraft that must be manually set before each takeoff. In this case, the pilot stated that the normal radar altimeter setting for MedStar would have been 500 feet at night, but she also stated that she could not remember what altitude she set the radar altimeter to. The pilot stated the TAWS was working and functional and that it did give her an alarm, 
but that she disregarded it because she said it was not uncommon to hear that warning during a descent for landing. But it was also noted that the TAW screen would turn to a solid red screen to display a low altitude warning since she believed they were still at 500 feet. Night vision goggles could certainly have played a major role in avoiding this accident. However, at the time of the accident, MedStar pilots had not yet completed the training for their NVGs and the program's NVG program had not yet been approved by the FAA. But they were hoping to have the NVGs fully implemented later that year. This brings us to the autopilot system of this helicopter, which it was equipped, and on this helicopter is called an Automatic Flight Control System, or AFCS. The autopilot in the EC-145 was a three-axis system that can control pitch, yaw, and roll, but not power. That will become very important later on. There is literally a button that is pressed on the center console to engage the AFCS, which is called the Autopilot Mode Selector, or APMS button. These types of buttons require you to actually push them in as opposed to rotating them. To turn them on and engage the autopilot, the pilot must first press the AP1 button, which normally is illuminated with the off light, and then the off light will extinguish. To turn the system off, you simply press the AP1 button again, and the off light will reappear. One of the functions of the autopilot is the ALT function, which stands for altitude hold. When engaged and airspeed is over 60 knots, this function will ensure that the helicopter maintains the selected altitude while still flying forward. During interviews, one Czech airman did state that during a check ride with the accident pilot, he reported that during a flight, she mismanaged the autopilot and he observed her spin the knob. Remember, this button you have to push, not spin. But then when he asked her about it, she said she thought that she had pushed the altitude hold button when in fact she had not. The accident pilot stated that during the accident flight, she did not remember ever disconnecting the autopilot during the flight, and she knew that she was at the controls during impact. She also stated that just before impact, she did remember seeing an amber altitude alert on her primary flight display which indicated that the autopilot was engaged when the helicopter impacted the water. So, if the autopilot was engaged, how did the helicopter fly straight into the water? How could they even determine the cause since the pilot stated nothing was wrong with the aircraft and all of the flight data recordings were destroyed? Well, I'll tell you, the investigators determined the cause with science. Under the supervision of the NTSB, a simulation of the event was recreated at Eurocopter's facility in Grand Prairie, Texas. The entire accident was recreated exactly in their EC-145 simulator with four possible scenarios for the accident being identified. The first two scenarios involved disengagement of the autopilot, but these two scenarios were quickly determined to be unlikely since the pilot adamantly stated that she saw that amber altitude warning light right before impact, which means the autopilot was still engaged. The third scenario involved accidentally setting the autopilot to vertical speed mode instead of altitude hold mode, but again, this scenario was quickly ruled out since the pilot also adamantly stated that she set the autopilot to altitude hold of 500 feet. This leaves us with the fourth scenario, which was that the pilot selected altitude hold to 500 feet, which is exactly what happened. The autopilot then did as commanded and slowly lowered the aircraft to 500 feet. However, even in autopilot mode, the power setting, which is controlled by the collective, must still be manually controlled by the pilot. In this case, the power setting was not enough to maintain both a 500 feet altitude and the forward speed of about 80 knots, which is what she had. If the pilot does not add power, then the aircraft will pitch up when it gets to the selected altitude to try and maintain that altitude. But again, without enough power inputted through the collective, the aircraft could not maintain the forward speed and the altitude. 
When this happens, in order to not stall out the aircraft, it will descend straight through the selected altitude until the pilot pulls the collective and adds power, which in this case, she never did, which is why the helicopter continued descending until it impacted the water. Also, when descending and going below that altitude, the green indication light on the flight display will turn amber, which is exactly what happened in this case as the pilot said she saw that amber light. So while the aircraft was flying forward at about 80 knots, the pilot set the autopilot to an altitude hold of 500 feet. The aircraft continued to fly forward while slowly descending from 800 to 500 feet. But due to an unknown cause, such as possibly being distracted by trying to contact the fire department on the ground, or maybe just a simple act of forgetfulness, the pilot never pulled any power when the aircraft got to 500 feet. Instead, the aircraft, as designed, simply continued to descend slowly while still flying forward until it impacted the water. The NTSB found that the probable cause of this accident was the pilot's failure to arrest the helicopter's descent, which resulted in controlled flight into terrain, in this case, water. So why did the pilot not pull power and allow the aircraft to descend through its target altitude? Well, she clearly was an experienced pilot and she certainly wouldn't have done it on purpose. But as I mentioned earlier, she did previously make a similar mistake during a check ride and I have no idea of knowing what the outcome came from that. But either way, this is a perfect place to segue into part two of this story. For this second part, I'm simply going to give you a very quick timeline of events. There is far more to this story than I will speak about because I'm not here to take sides or talk about what he said or she said. I want to share this very vague timeline of events for the sole purpose of showing what can happen when you work in aviation or even in ground EMS and a just culture is not supported or implemented? Ready? Here we go. This crash happens in August of 2009. Following the crash, Lee County decided to implement what they called a safety shutdown of the entire program in June of 2011. This shutdown lasted six weeks as Lee County officials believed there was a toxic culture within MedStar which was possibly due to the fallout from the EC-145 crash. Whether or not that toxic culture actually existed is hard to prove, but the shutdown did happen, and consultants and experts did come in to try and improve things, but I couldn't find any documentation of their recommendations or that anything was actually implemented following their services. Shortly thereafter, in May of 2011, Lee County purchases a used Bell 430 to replace the crashed 145 with its first flight taking place in October of 2011. This aircraft was not yet certified under Part 135, so for the next three months they actually operated under their Part 91 certificate and did not bill for the 39 patients that they transported during that time. The Bell 430 then does go and get its Part 135 certificate in February of 2012. But then, someone, I don't know who, tells someone to start billing for the transports in the Bell 430. But in order to actually fly the aircraft under Part 135 and to legally bill the patients, both the aircraft and the pilot must hold the 135 certificate. Whistleblower Arnold McAllister, a MedStar pilot, emails supervisors in April of 2012 about improper flight training for their pilots. In order to certify those pilots, the company flight instructors who do the training must be an approved company instructor and also must complete their own FAA checkride as a company flight instructor. In this case, though, the company flight instructors for MedStar who were doing this flight training apparently were not approved company instructors, nor had they completed their FAA company instructor checkride, and therefore were not allowed to certify the other pilots before they themselves went on to complete their own FAA checkrides with FAA check airmen. As MedStar did not properly hold their 135 certificate then, they legally could not bill for the flights. But for some unknown reason, MedStar did continue to bill for flights to the tune of nearly $3 million. 
There was lots of documentation where employees alleged that they brought these concerns to their supervisors but were met with hostility and the improper billing continued. McAllister recommends to county officials in his complaint email that Lee County and MedStar should self-report these violations to the FAA to avoid higher fines. McAllister then gets put on a performance improvement plan and taken off the helicopter. Come August 2012, MedStar actually stops flying altogether. And at the same time, MedStar terminated their director of operations, three other pilots, and all 12 of their flight paramedics were reassigned to ground ambulances. At one point here, they claimed they were closing in order to seek and gain CAMES national accreditation for the flight program. But even a CAMES spokesman mentioned that this would not make sense and there was no need to suspend the program in order to seek program accreditation. A few weeks later, Lee County kind of admits and stated that they were actually closing because they fired the flight operations manager and now could no longer maintain their 135 certificate. However, technically, they could have hired an interim manager and they could have kept flying under their Part 91 certificate, just like they did when they first put the Bell 430 in service. But it was alleged that the reason for shutting down flight operations was actually to avoid a federal whistleblower lawsuit. I am unsure if those allegations were ever fully investigated. But around the same time, a lawsuit brought by a former flight paramedic back in 2007 finally goes to trial. And in this case, the flight paramedic alleged that she was terminated because she reported to her supervisors that they were altering billing logs and illegally billing way back in 2007, two years before the crash even happened. Later on, sometime in 2012, MedStar and Lee County admit that they had improperly billed patients for nearly $3 million. They had actually already collected over $320,000, of which all of it had to be returned. Just a few months later, November 2012, MedStar announces that they will take the flight program private and would sell their helicopters and contract with a private helicopter EMS service. After that, in late November 2012, the county manager stepped down from her role. The public safety director retired and the county attorney resigned. The FAA then closes the investigation in January of 2013 without imposing any of the millions of dollars in proposed fines. Then, another federal lawsuit was filed by Robert Fulton, who also worked at MedStar, where he claimed that supervisors refused to consider him for a transfer to another position after MedStar shut down because he reported and opposed unlawful billing of Medicare and Medicaid. Lee County ultimately did end up contracting with a private service, in this case, Air Methods. The service is now branded under the name Lee Flight, where they fly beautiful EC-130s and where both the pilot and the flight nurse are employees of Air Methods, and the flight paramedic is still a Lee County employee. Man, I'll tell you what, what a story. All links and sources are listed in the comments below. But back to the question, why did that EC-145 crash into the water? Yes, the pilot forgot to pull power and caused a controlled flight into the water, but did culture play a role in her forgetting this step? Were there shortcuts taken in the training? Was this already a toxic work environment? Man, I don't know. But the pilot and the paramedics on that flight all stated that they got along and had open communication. But in just culture, it goes far beyond just that of the flight crew. It extends to the mechanics and to the ground paramedics and EMTs, to the fire departments, and especially up their chain of command, in this case, all the way up to the county commissioners. Please tell me what you think about this story in the comments below. How do you think this could have been prevented? Like I said at the beginning, this story had a lot of curveballs and rabbit holes, but in the end, no one died. A beautiful EC-145 was destroyed, and a lot of people suffered a lot of angst and stress, ultimately leading to the end of a wildly successful flight program. I do thank you for taking the time to watch. If you thought that this video was at all beneficial to your world, please throw me a like, and more importantly, hit that subscribe button so that I can continue making these videos in the future.
cheers to everyone out there, especially those in the EMS world and the helicopter EMS world. I've got nothing but peace and love for you all, and I do hope that you all have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank <laughs> you.